Welcome this week to part two of our interview with Iva May, the founder of CBT. Sequels are always better. That's what I always say. Bible literacy drives everything in our lives. Bible literacy drives evangelism, discipleship, apologetics, theology, and missions. This is going to be a great ride. Part two of Iva May's interview. I'm Joel. I'm Jake. This is CBT Talks. Well, Joe, I do just want to say uh, sequels are never better than the original. There's very few exceptions to that rule. Um, and I'm including the New Testament to Old Testament. I feel like the Old Testament holds up as well as Whoa, the New Testament. Whoa, now. I'm just, hold I'm just up. saying, I, I enjoy You're, it. No, I no, enjoy no, no. I'm not saying I disagree. I'm just saying that's, yeah, be careful. Okay, okay. So. Well, listen, listen. Uh, <laughs> As we uh, continued on last week, uh, we showed some of Iva's uh, interview questions. We sat down and talked with her. This week, we're finishing up that interview, just explaining uh, all the wonderful conversations we had with her. And the first question we asked her this week, although it's been a few weeks since we actually sat down with her, uh, we just said, well, Iva, what is CBT? CBT is a unique approach in the sense of we're used to looking at the story of the Bible from pieces, from uh, Old Testament piece and New Testament piece, without putting a lot of thought into there's a consistent narrative being told behind it. So every individual story fits into a greater story, a narrative. And uh, so CBT builds the context uh, for the story, each of the stories of the Bible by uh, developing a framework uh, so that people, uh, readers, would be able to discover the story of the Bible, to understand that story, and then be able to tell the story to others. Well, I was very impressed with Iva's answer to what is CBT, and I'm going to tell you why. I remember the first time I ever asked Iva, like, what is CBT? And uh, about four hours later, I still had no idea what CBT was. There was <laughs> so much information, so much uh, explanation for, for what all CBT was. So I think she did a great job at just in, in a very short time just explaining really the heart of what CBT is. But if you listen to that answer and you're still thinking to yourself, I still have no idea what CBT is, the best advice I can give is to go to CBT's website, chronologicalbibleteaching.com. And on there, there's an explanation of all the teachings, all the beliefs, uh, the history. Basically, if you want to know what CBT is, that website's a good place to start. But if you want a more in-depth explanation – Joel has been just aching uh, to give this little spill. <laughs> well, a spill it will be. Uh, uh, the CBT really is is founded on the 14 era framework, and so when Iva came back from Africa, she was looking to uh, teach the story of the Bible to literate. People. And so the 14 eras are simply a way to divide all of Scripture. And in each period of time, each era, we see that God speaks into human history. He gives instructions, promises, prohibitions. And then He carries out His will. He acts. And so in each of these eras, uh, what CBT does is it, is it teaches believers to read through the story of the Bible and see God's character and this brokenness of man and our need uh, for redemption as we see God speaking and as we see God acting. Now, CBT is a pool of resources, discipleship resources, that are all organized around that 14-era framework so that ultimately we can uh, discover the story of the Bible, yeah. understand the story of the Bible, and then go tell the story of the Bible. Well, I think that was perhaps an, an even better explanation of what CBT is. So, so props to you, but I want you to know. Are you saying better than Iva? Possibly. Well, yeah. see, well I don't know. Is she going to look? Yeah, she, Iva, she's going to be listening to this. No, Iva. Iva your pays the bills. Perfect. 100%. I'm on your side. I don't like him either. It's fine. We'll just ignore his non-authoritative answer. But you know, as I just you, don't want to get in trouble because you said that my explanation was better. That's I want all. you to know, um, you will always get in trouble for what I say, <laughs> and that's what makes it that's what makes it funny for me. But you know, uh, talking oh, about that we're framework, too much fun. talking about that framework, um, you know what it reminds me of? I kind of picture it like this in my head: the fourteen eras are the fourteen seasons 
of the Bible, like if it was a TV show. It's divided into 14 seasons. In each of those seasons, you know, you have different you have different episodes, different scenes, but each of those airs make up a season for that period of time as it goes through. And, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but, but you know, I, I know that you do, but for all of our listeners, you know, your chapter numbers and your verse numbers are not part of the original text of your Bible. They were added later simply to provide a framework so that when people are studying and reading the Bible, um, you can say, hey, this chapter, this verse, and people can turn in their Bible and know exactly what you're talking about. You don't just have to say, I don't know, it's in there somewhere, find it. Uh, But somewhere down the line, we started ignoring that framework. And now when you go to a Bible reading plan, it'll have you read like a a chapter out of this book and then a few verses out of this book. Then it'll be like, and then you do this proverb and it'll throw in a psalm. And it's all over the place. And it's so difficult to follow that story. And so the reason I think of the 14 areas as seasons is because if you were to make a TV show of the Bible in chronological order, just this happened, then this happened, you would end up with 14 seasons making up those 14 eras uh, and it would all be in chronological order and it would be so satisfying and one day i believe someone might be able to make that perfect bible tv show and if it's not on this side of heaven i know that that'll be the first thing i do when in heaven i'll watch the real bible tv show the chosen is making that happen look i, I want to say this because uh our 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 cbt logo is is on the desk here i know that that was bad for the audio quality but if you can see this if you're watching the youtube video uh we use the the visual of a puzzle and a puzzle piece to describe what cbt is attempting to accomplish you know if you take a puzzle and dump out all the pieces uh, Jake, you pick up one individual piece, and it's very difficult to to know make any sense out of that one individual piece. There's no context. So mm-hmm. what do we have to do? We have to get the 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 cover of the puzzle uh, on the box. We have to see the picture of exactly what is supposed to to be created. When we see that picture, then we want to find the corners and the edges. And so what, what are we trying to do is we put a puzzle together. We're trying to take individual pieces and we're trying to figure out what is, the, what is the context, what is the big picture so that I know what to do with this individual puzzle piece. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's what CBT does uh, with the Bible. Um, yeah, at, the, at its very heartbeat, it's CBT is not providing resources to replace the Bible. CBT absolutely. is providing resources to just help you understand the Bible. So, you know, what is the best book to study if you want to do a Bible study? The Bible. And the CBT wants to help you understand the Bible as you're reading through it. That's that's really at the heartbeat. But you know, we we actually skipped a little bit as as we were talking about this. You know, we, we identified last week that problem of Bible illiteracy in the, in the church, the fact that a lot of people just have no idea what the Bible says. And then uh, I would just answer like, what is CBT? But a question that we need to, to ask, and so we, we did ask her, is, well, you know, uh, Iva, when did you decide to spend your entire life, like, devoted to solving this problem? When did you go from someone who is Bible literate and thought, uh, oh, this is a problem, someone else should do something about that? To being like, no, I'm going to be the Bible literacy person. I, I'm going to devote the rest of my life in, into fixing Bible literacy. And that's a really good question. I think it just comes back to great discipleship in the sense of helping people understand you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And you and it's a requirement of glorifying God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Reminding people and reminding myself of, um, of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God foreordained for us to walk into. And, you know, for me, it's to make the challenge to people that there's got to be more than living on the right street in the right town, having the right career, wearing the right clothes, driving the right car. That's not success, but a success is a life laid down for the sake of the gospel. So for me to understand what God is calling me to and investing in the lives of other people is that I'm not my own. That means that spending time with people is not convenient. It's not an eight to five job. That pouring into people is a requirement of my life being laid down. And I, I think there's a huge loss in discipleship that 
that a call to Christ is a call to die, a call to die to yourself. And so for me, when we came back to the States, now I was involved in teaching a class at the seminary, seminary called Women in Cross-Cultural Ministry. And it was through this class that I was exposed to uh, a lot of seminary student wives that I thought, man, I would love to invest in their lives more deeply. Wouldn't it be great to turn them loose in local churches to deliver Bible literacy to their people? How cool would that be? And so I developed the W3 material, which is Women, Worldview, and the Word, uh, with the goal in mind to helping them see who God is for women and help them to see who God is for women, he is for them, and that he's for the women in their in their ministries. So that they'll enter in ministry as a person of grace and truth, but grace to, for women to know that, that God is for Hagar. He's, he sees the invisible. That God is for um, women who struggle with infertility, who struggle with um, feeling invisible even to their husbands. I mean, Sarah was betrayed for her husband twice. We have this idea that Abraham was, because he was a patriarch, that he was this um, spotless, virtuous man. And you see, when you look at his life, that he struggled with self-protection. He struggled with um, uh, loving himself, being self-absorbed. Um, but he also, when God called him in that, he was this kind of self-focused person. But God, what God was doing is he was moving him from being self-focused and self-protective to absolutely trusting him. So when God spoke to him, he told he and his barren wife, they're going to have a child, which means if God didn't come through for them, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have a child. God was obligating himself to do for them what they could not do. So I think in discipleship is we're, we've got this education, we've got talents and abilities, we can go to all these self-help things. And so we think we have a lot to offer. And it's really God who spends our life stripping us down to help us see that we have nothing, that we cannot give away what we do not possess. In the sense of what people need is more of God. And so the more I know him, the more I'm able to give him away into the lives of other people. And so for me, when I developed this material, I had no idea it was more uh, than just something I was going to use with local women. I was asked to train uh, women in another church, uh, uh, their leadership team, on how to utilize the stories to teach the story of the Bible and, and, and to penetrate the hearts of women in, in, in ministry. And then it led on, it led to doing some other things. But I think the, the fundamental foundational thing that chronological Bible teaching does is teaching the Bible in 14 eras. It's breaking down the story, teaching era by era, and then putting it together and helping people see how fluid the story is. And not only is the story fluid, it's simple enough for anybody to learn. And then once you understand the framework, you can spend the rest of your life putting flesh on that skeleton. And so it's a framework that's critical for understanding the story of the Bible, that there are pieces of that story that's important for us to, to see the developing story of the Bible, seeing the connections it makes. And so uh, for me as a discipler, it was more important to, for me to help people see truth for themselves than for me to teach everything I knew about particular stories of the Bible. So chronological Bible teaching is a question-led discipleship material where you look at a text and then you ask discovery questions about the text so that every participant, they're looking primarily at the word of God and they're asking questions about what's going on here? What does this reveal about God? Where else have we seen this truth about human nature, about the character of God? And and then helping them realize that when they're learning this, that God is actually putting his finger on the pulse of their life. And he's tapping something very specifically, like much, very much like Moses was doing when he was recording Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why? Because he was God was putting his finger on the hearts and minds of his people, on their pulse, to change them. In the same way that I see with women today when they're exposed to scripture at this level by asking questions. That I believe that God has greater access to their heart because they're personally engaged. They're not just sitting there as a learner, sitting there at the feet of a teacher, me, but they're sitting as a learner, sitting at the feet of the teacher, the Holy Spirit, as he uses the word of God to penetrate their hearts. Um, so that's kind of my journey, just experimenting with, with women back in the day at seminary and seeing that grow and expand and to see that what I was doing with women, it was, uh, it was, it was replicated 
that what how I poured into them was exactly what they did within their own context and with other women. You know, for me, that I, there's no job, no career path, no ac human accolades that compares with knowing that you've invested in another person who's capable of investing in other people and that they will outlive you and outshine you. It's amazing. Wow, I absolutely love hearing those stories and how how CBT just kind of organically grew. It didn't it didn't it wasn't established from a business plan mm -hmm. uh, or a or an investment round. Uh, CBT literally started with Ava gathering seminary wives in a room and and mm -hmm. working out in real time what it meant to teach them the story of the Bible. Yeah. Um, here's here's the deal. The Bible says our life is a vapor. We have a mm -hmm. limited amount of time to mm -hmm. know God, understand what he said about himself, become expert communicators of that, and share it with the world. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing I just want all our listeners to hear. If you can't right now start in Genesis and explain the big story of the Bible all the way to the end, understanding the character of God to the place where you can pass that on and teach others, uh, you need to uh, check CBT out. You need to check out the 14 era framework uh, because it will help. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just also just a reason why uh, so many people trust CBT so much and trust Iva May because she doesn't do this for, for a career. She does not receive a paycheck for, for anything. So when you look at how CBT has grown and how God has honored and, and blessed it, you know, you don't have to worry that this was like a, a brainchild of some investment fund thinking, how can we make money off the church? <laughs> like, it, it, it really was just, just someone saying, I need to teach the story of the Bible to others. And then those people were like, we want to teach the story of the Bible to others. Mm -hmm. And it is just that basic discipleship formula of, of we are called to make disciples who make disciples. And when you actually put that into practice, because it is so rare nowadays, people are like, how did you pull that off? And I was like, well, I mean, I, I just, this is how I did it. This is my thoughts, the framework. And they're like, can you write that down for us? And then that's how CBT started. That That's really mm. at its heart is, is just Iva saying, God has commanded me to make disciples. While I was uh, attempting to obey God in that, yeah, <laughs> we end up with CBT, <laughs> right? And and look, we have got big news. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know when we're gonna drop this big news, mm -hmm. uh, but it is huge, and uh, it's it's big news about something coming next year, mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 when. When, when, when people hear about this big news and they realize that all of this started with, with just the, the simplicity of mm -hmm. Iva having this carefree uh, attitude of saying, well, we started printing books because people asked us to. So many people were asking us for it. So we just started giving it to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing story. And, but don't we see God doing that all through scripture, over and over, mm -hmm. when God's people began drifting uh, from uh, a commitment to his word and, and to him, he raises up stewards of his word, and mm -hmm. then he uses those stewards to, to pass his, uh, his, his desire and his will onto that generation and the next. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of... Uh... Uh, you know, a parable uh, that Jesus was uh, said once. I, I'm blanking on the reference, but you know, he says that if you are invited into someone's house uh, to sit down at the table, you need to take the seat of most dishonor, and then the master of the house will elevate you and put you in the seat of honor. But if you try to place yourself in that seat of honor, uh, there's a chance that you will at, instead be asked to move because someone of more honor. Uh, shows up and is going to take that seat instead. And so uh, I think really what we, we're seeing is is God honoring the attempts of, of servants who tried very hard not to make much of themselves. 
And I think that is a, a wonderful thing. And, you know, one of the proofs of that is, you know, I've amazed the founder of CBT. She's not hosting the podcast. Uh, do you want to know why? Because she's busy trying to make disciples. And so she is saying as CBT grows, it's not the I've amazed show. It's a, it's about the Bible. It's CBT talks. That's an amazing thing. And, you know, you reference this big special project dropping, and, and I also – cannot go into detail about that because I don't know if I'm allowed to. But here's what I will say. This is a resource for the church. And that leads actually to the next question that we asked Iva, which is how did CBT make that transition from from really just being a, a, a company, a, a nonprofit that makes resources solely for individuals to thinking, how can we help the church? Uh, so we just asked Iva, you know, when slash how did CBT start making discipleship resources for the church uh, and, you know, still making resources now? Yeah, I love that question because I think any time that God pulls you into a story and gives you a task to do, you have no idea how it's going to evolve. And for me, I was just obeying the last thing the Lord put in my heart to do was investing in seminary student wives. but. Um, Joel, your testimony as well, because your wife was in one of those groups. And what did she do? She came home and she was telling you about all that she was learning. And what were your thoughts? I didn't get this in seminary. Because in seminary, what do we, what are, what's taught in seminary? A lot of nuts and bolts about the Bible. But as far as teaching the story arc of the Bible and God's revelation of himself through the Bible, we learn doctrine and theology and and all these are important. These are great tools, great resources, and every pastor must have them. But there, how do you unpack the Bible in a way that really does feed your people? And because we've been given a certain model of pastoral proclamation from the pulpit, and there's a need for that. So I'm not diminishing that at all. But when it comes to spending time and helping people grow and moving more relationally into a person's life, you can't do that from the pulpit. So what do you do? Can you use the same style in a small group study as a teacher? Oh, come my little students, let me teach you everything I know. No, what happens is, is they will grow. Their growth is amazing because you're sitting there with them and you're teaching them a hermeneutic, how to unpack the Bible for themselves. And you're giving them a tool that they can duplicate, that they can replicate with other people. And so this is what's happened is women, they go home and tell their husbands, their husbands begin to put pressure on, how come no one's doing this for men? And so then we develop the men's piece and uh, we develop a student's piece. We develop Sunday school material because churches wanted to take their, their people through reading through the one year chronological Bible in a year. And it's like, we need Sunday school material for this. And so we quickly wrote some material to accompany that. Um, and so it's just grown in unexpected ways. I didn't get into this so that I could write a bunch of material. I'm not a writer by nature. I, in fact, when a writer a project comes to me, I'm like, oh my word, I, I cannot take on this. It's just so above me, beyond me. I, I don't have the ability to do this, but I know it's God's calling on my life. You know, listening to Iva unpack mm -hmm. that progression uh, that, that just brings back so many memories for me. And she mentioned my story. So I, I really, I really want to tell my story real quick. I was uh, into ministry maybe 10 years. I'd pastored two churches and we are preparing to go overseas. And as a part of that preparation, uh, we, Heather lands in a discipleship group with Ava May. Heather is his wife, by yeah. the way. Heather is Heather is my amazing bride. So she lands in a discipleship group with Ava May. And I'll never forget the first night. Uh, we drove home together, and my wife literally slung DNA all over the car. I'm talking snot spit mm. the whole nine yards. I mean, she was having a crying emotional fit. And, and I, I mean, I was, I was disoriented for what in the world mm. just happened in that Bible study. And, and, and my wife began that night um, uh, telling me she had never heard someone explain the story of the Bible like she had just heard it. And she was in a, in a state of mourning mm. and repentance and she would ask me, Joel, how could we have been in ministry this long 
and not know these things. Mm -hmm. How could we have thought we knew the Bible? But in fact, I'm, I'm realizing we just don't know it. We've mm -hmm. been arrogant before the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife would come home every week from, from this discipleship group, and she would start telling me uh, things. And, mm -hmm. and the first time, the first time I, I, I even heard a, a, a connection like the redemption thread, and I, mm -hmm. I don't, because of time, I don't think I should really go into that. That's another episode <laughs> where, where we talk about I'll, threads yeah, and, I'll, I'll and demonstrate to the list. <laughs> that. But, but, you know, just real quickly, the, the, the first time that I heard that, mm -hmm. that, that in, in the garden, man who God created as, as his image bears rejected him. And as a, as a result of rejecting mm -hmm. him, the Bible calls that sin. Uh, the punishment for their sin was death. But God uh, began redemptive work. And, and he did two things. He gave them a promise and a picture. That mm -hmm. promise was that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And, and so they would understand that promise. He gave them a picture. He took the, the clothes of an innocent animal or animals and clothed them with those mm -hmm. skins. And when God did that, he, he shed innocent blood, the first blood that was, was shed on earth. And we find out as we march through Scripture what God was doing. He was setting his terms for salvation, that salvation would come through the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the mm -hmm. guilty. And so they were to cling to this promise, and they passed it on to their sons. Abel clung to that promise. Cain did not. Noah clung to that promise. And everywhere you see these stories, mm -hmm. uh, Abel and Noah brought blood sacrifices to God. Why? Because God had given a promise and a picture. Mm. Oh, it was, it was, there was going to be one who would remove the results of sin forever, uh, but, but, but salvation would come as that one would shed his innocent blood. And, and as the story of the Bible unpacks further, uh, we get all the way to Passover, where God mm. tells his people before they come out of Egypt to shed, to take the blood of an innocent lamb and paint it on the doorpost of their house so that when the angel of death passed, uh, he would say, death already occurs here. Mm -hmm. What was that? That was a picture of the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty. The Passover lamb mm -hmm. died uh, an innocent death uh, so that the family could be redeemed, mm -hmm. could live. And you get all the way, you get all the way to John mm -hmm. the Baptist in the New Testament. And John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, behold, the Lamb of God mm. who takes away the sins of the world. Andrew yep. hears John the Baptist, goes and tells his brother Peter, we have found the promised one. And, mm -hmm. and, and how did he know that? Because of the picture of the Passover, mm -hmm. because of the picture in the garden, because God had given his people a promise and a picture. Mm -hmm. Listen, my wife started coming home and, and telling me mm -hmm. things like this. And, and if, if, by the way, if you're listening and that's the first time you've ever heard anything like that, you, you're, you're hearing what I heard the first time. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of gaps, a lot of holes, uh, and, but it, mm -hmm. it made me crave more. What is going on in, in this Bible study? I just began to soak it up, and here I am now. Um, so, yeah. I, I, you know, th this, th this, uh, this whole issue um, really, really leads us up to the next question that we asked Iva. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that question was, Iva, what, what is it about studying the big story of the Bible and knowing the meta narrative of mm -hmm. Scripture that helps us understand God more than, say, uh, facts in a theological textbook? Yeah, um, I love that question, Joel. I remember when it occurred to me um, uh, years ago when I was reading the book of Genesis that the book of Genesis was written by Moses to a specific audience, and that audience were the newly liberated Hebrews. And the newly li liberated Hebrews had lived immersed in the Egyptian culture for several centuries. And so therefore they were exposed to all kinds of false ideas about God. And they had this slave mentality having been slaves. And so they were being liberated by God, brought into the wilderness to dismantle those old ways and those wrong ideas about who God is. And so what did God do? God set up camp in their midst. And he set up camp, why? Because he wanted to reveal himself to his people. He had chosen them to manifest himself um, uh, through them and a promise to Abraham that they would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. 
So in order for them to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, it's, 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 it's imperative that they know the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And that's really what opened up the book of Genesis for me is God was very intentional in his revelation of himself as a personal God and as a God who was teaching them sport, basic lessons about spiritual formation. Because when he brings Abraham into his story, Abraham's 75 years old. And so we have the entirety of his story from the time he's 75 to the time he's 175 when God teaches this former idolater how to walk with him by faith. And then you have the entirety of Isaac's life and of Jacob's life. And you have uh, the building block of Israel through the 12 tribes of Israel. You have this introduction of Judah and understanding, you know, how deeply broken he was because he was assimilated into the Canaanite people. He married a, a Canaanite woman that had... Um, Half, half Hebrew, half Canaanite sons. They were wicked before the eyes of the Lord. God killed the first two sons. And so you just see the danger of assimilation there by intermarrying with the Canaanite people. And so these stories would alert or should alert the Hebrew people when Moses starts talking to them about when you enter the land of Canaan, you know, to don't intermarry with them, don't worship their idols because assimilation with the peoples around them would negatively impact them. And they would commit apostasy and they would depart from the living God. And so for me, um, understanding that Moses had a particular audience, who was this audience? What was their context? And so what was he recording that was important to unscramble, to help them face, uh, dismantle those wrong views of God so that they might trust the living God? And of course, that whole generation uh, it was a fail. <clears throat> it was a, 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 a F minus. They failed. And they spent 40 years in the wilderness not learning. And so and then again, you have God's instructions to Moses through the book of Deuteronomy, preparing this new generation to enter into the land of Canaan. And it's um, it's imperative that they know their story from Genesis to Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why? Because he tells them to read it every out loud every seven years for the people. And um, they were to teach these things to their children from the time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed. He establishes the Levitical priesthood as they are now stewards of God's story. They're to educate based on the book of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so what you see is he's, Moses is establishing for the children of Israel that Bible literacy is a core value for them as a people, that they would only flourish spiritually in the land of Canaan when they know the living God and walk in his ways. And so for me, it's important for us to understand what is true about Israel is true about us as people today and how God is with Israel is how he is with us today, bringing us back to Bible literacy. If we don't know the word of God, how he's laid out his revelation through the scriptures, then we will not understand why he's doing what he does in our lives today. You know, as I was listening to her, I was thinking about you and, uh, and how you continually talk about binge watching and series and, mm -hmm. you know, the Marvel universe and all of that stuff. I, I yep. wonder, I wonder if you would be willing to watch a movie or, or a series that is, is, you know, just theological bullet points. No, I already had to do that in seminary. <laughs> I didn't super love it. <laughs> See, here's the thing. It, we have gaps in our knowledge of God because mm -hmm. we have gaps in our knowledge of Scripture, mm -hmm. and uh, so many, so many. Uh, if we're not, if we're not careful, so many of us can can construct a view of God that is not based on what we have encountered in His Word, but just what we read in a textbook. Mm -hmm. And 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 God did not choose to reveal Himself in a textbook. He revealed Himself in a and a story, yep. and and it is so important for us to encounter that story for ourselves, and 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 be drawn into that story because it's only through God's story that we can find our place in that story. Yep. And and I want to just say this real quick because we get into trouble in the church. We we don't realize we have a huge blind spot. When, when you go overseas and you start encountering every religion under the sun, what you realize is that every religion has a, 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 a very basic um, uh, meeting point, intersection. Uh, they all get to a place where whatever they worship cannot be understood. 
They all get to a place where they have to explain something as mystery, something as mystical. Mm -hmm. The key uh, uh, aspect or, or, or the red flag that goes up on a, on a cult or a, any false religion is, is the second someone starts talking about mysticism, something mystical happened that it takes a special knowledge to, mm -hmm. to be able to understand. Boy, that is a sure sign that you're dealing with a false religion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the cornerstone truth of the Bible is this. God wants to be known. Mm -hmm. He started communicating about himself in Genesis 1 by saying, in the beginning, this is who I am. God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. And he tells this story so that we'll understand this creator. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that when we talk about Bible literacy and we talk about people really just not knowing the story of the Bible, we're really talking about two different aspects of, of not knowing. Some people don't know the story of the Bible because they, they simply don't know much of the Bible. Maybe they've never read it. Uh, maybe they've never been to church. Maybe this is their first time hearing the gospel. And ironically, often it, it's those people who have a lack of overall knowledge that are most receptive to, to learning the story. Uh, but sometimes when we start talking about Bible literacy and asking, like, can you tell the story of the Bible? You might have someone who's been going to church for 60 years who has listened to sermon after sermon after sermon, but they're still Bible literate. And every once in a while, they'll, they'll get, you know, defensive over the accusation that, that they don't know the Bible well enough. And so I think it's important to point out when we talk about Bible literacy, uh, like you said, we're not talking about a, a list of facts uh, that you have memorized. We're not talking about stuff that you can learn in a, a theological textbook or even reading from a commentary. We're talking about connecting all the dots of the story together to make sense of what you've read. And I got a, I got a perfect example that you actually mentioned it earlier. Uh, you know, talked about uh, the story of Cain and Abel. Abel uh, accepted uh, and embraced the the sacrificial system, that, that picture and that promise, or the promise in the picture of the shedding of the blood of the innocent on the half of the guilty. Now, I knew in seminary from, from studying the Old Testament, uh, I knew that man did not eat meat until after Noah's flood. And I also knew the story of Cain and Abel, that Cain raised crops uh, and Abel uh, raised livestock. But I never really connected those two stories together uh, in this overall direction, and it hit me. I remember my first time reading through the Bible chronologically, it just hit me as I was trying to piece all this together. Wait a minute, why was Abel raising livestock if they weren't allowed to eat meat? What was he doing? It wasn't just to, to make clothes. There are better ways to make clothes. Why are you raising livestock? Because they knew a sacrifice had to be made. So all of a sudden, this, this idea that Cain was not willing to buy livestock from the brother that he hated to offer the right sacrifice, this story starts making sense. I'm able to start piecing these things together. It, it's, not that, uh, it's not that all churchgoers have a lack of intellectual knowledge about the Bible. They, they've seen all the scenes uh, in, in this TV series. They, they've seen the episodes. They know the characters, but... Well, but they've it, seen a few scenes. The, <laughs> the scenes that play well on a 20-minute sermon on, on, on the Sunday highlight mornings. reel, yeah. But Unless but you the, go to our church, it's a, it's a 35 to 40-minute sermon. <laughs> no, no, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah, but, you know, the, the thing is connecting the dots and piecing that story together. And what you were doing earlier, just pulling that uh, part of the redemption thread, is just saying that all of these stories help us understand all these other stories. And what I've... Uh, was even saying about the, the Israelites as they are trying to learn who the living God is. You know, God identifies himself in those stories over and over as I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God wanted them to know their story. God wanted to teach them who he was by telling them the story of the Bible. Why in the world do we start attempting to teach uh, God to others with these huge theological definitions and the saying, well, he, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's present, he's imminent. He, we list all these things. 
when God reveals himself to someone, he identifies himself. Not through definitions, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You want to know who I am? You read those stories. You learn those stories, and I will show you who I am. You know, I'm I'm just getting pumped up and excited. I want to talk so bad, but you just keep talking. (laughs) I'm sorry. You should should motor mount today. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I don't want you to stop. You're on fire. Go ahead. No, it, that that's all. That's all I had for for that one. Off camera, he's going to tell me that I ruined it. No, no, no. Look, when when you were just talking about how um, uh, God was saying, "Look, I'm I I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob." If you want to know uh, what that means, mm-hmm. go back and read these stories. You know, when you started listing out all those uh, theological attributes of God, you know, mm-hmm. God is is Creator, He's omniscient, He's all powerful, He's mm-hmm. omnipresent. All those things that we study uh, in mm-hmm. theology books. Uh, what, what we mean when we say read the story of the Bible, go back to Genesis 1. What defines, what we, we understand what power is, but we don't understand what God's power is. Mm-hmm. We understand what authority is, but we don't understand what God's authority is. Mm-hmm. We, we don't even have the capacity. So what does God do? He says, let me tell you a story. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a beginning, and I created everything that you can even see. And what, anything that is possible for you to discover, I created it, mm-hmm. right? So then, then he says, here's what happened. I said, let there be light. And mm-hmm. something that did not exist obeyed my voice and began existing. Mm-hmm. That is creator God. That is all authority. Mm-hmm. That is all power. Because it, it, I, I can have authority, but if I don't have power... So that what I say happens, uh, then what authority do I have? Yeah. So that's all power. That's all wisdom. Mm-hmm. Because if I have the authority uh, to say what I want to say mm-hmm. and the power to make it happen, then, oh, my word, I've got to have wisdom so that I don't say anything wrong mm-hmm. or foolish. So, I, like, what does it mean uh, for there to be a creator God who is omnipresent, omni, mm-hmm. omniscient, all uh, 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 all, uh, well, all the all. Well, yeah. So, uh, what does that mean? Well, mm-hmm. it, look at the story. Look at how it plays out. Mm-hmm. This, this, this yep. works it out for us. And, and I think if sometimes we get so focused on just the New Testament, on just of the the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we forget how the Bible describes Jesus Himself. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It says that he is the he is the word. He is this this he he's the word made flesh. He is God in a form that we can see and understand. Like that's how the Bible describes who Jesus is. And yet we'll go out uh, in our efforts for evangelism or in our efforts for doing basic Bible teaching, and instead we'll start by trying to get people to believe in Jesus. And it's like, well, how do they know what to believe in? How do you describe to them what Jesus is? Well, we come up with all kinds of ways to describe Jesus. The Bible describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God. Well, how do you know who God is? God says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you want to know who Jesus is, you have got to know who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is how he reveals himself. And it just, I tell you, nothing fires me up more. (laughs) Nothing fires me up more than hearing bad theology and bad missiology and bad ministry and then having someone receive a word from God to correct that 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 gets me fired up of like you know what we we are going to we're, we're going to preach the truth and you know that just actually leads us to the next question we asked Iva in this Bible literacy movement we asked her you know what are just some exciting things some things that just get you fired up that you're seeing from from churches and people who are committed who are dedicated to Bible literacy well, you know, when I see a church, when the pastor says, I want to preach through the entire storyline of the Bible and have our people read through the one-year chronological Bible over this next year and have a three to five-year strategy for Bible literacy, I get so excited because oftentimes what you see is churches, staff meets together once a year to plan for the next year. They're only one year out, you know, and they were caught this last year with COVID. Why? Because they only had one plan and it was only one year out and COVID what affected everyone. And I remember during this time, I was contacted by a church in South Carolina 
And uh, they had already gotten into the place of they were going to teach through the one year chronological Bible this last year. And that's what they did. But he told me, he said, you have no idea, except that God did, that this was go- this is the one thing that unified our church during the time of COVID. Because everyone was reading the same thing, talking about the same thing, processing the same thing. And we were able through our Zoom meetings and so on, keep people on track. They were having home devotions uh, that, that they were putting together and making them available to their entire church uh, to follow. And so they just said, we experienced such unity during this time. It was amazing. And uh, would that be wonderful if every church did that and they would experience it all the time? You know, because his... Jesus said that they will know they will know my church because we're unified. Why? Because they're one. They're walking together. And I think how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? And that's Amos 3.3. 3. And so if you have people reading, uh, you know, they're fine, doing a, one path this way, and then you have a bunch of other people in your church, and they're all doing their own thing, reading through the Bible. But what if you brought them all together and they're following one plan and reading it together? It would only unify them. So I, I'm excited when I see uh, churches have cast a vision for their people, the people buy into it and begin to read through the Bible. And this is one of the statements I hear consistently. I've never read through the Bible this year. I've never read through the Bible at all. This year, I've read through the Bible for the first time. And they may have been in church for 40 years or five years. Uh, you know, and so, but for me, is is reading through the Bible should be a regular habit of, of every single believer, and that for people to live in church their whole life and never have read through the whole Bible, it's heartbreaking. And I love your personal vision, Joel, as a pastor. You said it would be tragic for anyone coming through our youth department to graduate from high school and not have read through the Bible, can't tell the story of the Bible, how you've taken that personal I made it a challenge you and Jake to teach your young your, your students the storyline of the Bible. I love that. So for me, it's I just see that it re-energizes the church. Uh, pastors can wrap their heads around it. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, trying to do it from the pulpit, leading the church that way. But I see some re-engagement, some excitement about ministry uh, restored to them. It's not just a re- you know teaching through a series or a topic, but it's learning to how to handle the Word of God the way that God intended it to be handled. Um, so I see only in the future, I see great things. I see more and more pastors who are getting a passion for it, getting a vision for it, and seeing the un- and seeing and understanding the need for the hour as the Bible literate people and setting a strategy to make that happen within their own church. It's exciting. You know, I'm so glad that Iva uh, started talking about uh, COVID and its effect mm-hmm. on, on the churches. Because, uh, you know, as a minister, I'm, I'm not going to lie, when, when COVID first, like, happened, and there's talks of what the churches are going to have to shut down the doors, and they don't know when they'd be able to open, like, in a very real sense, part of me was like, well, I'm worried about my job now. Uh, how how long is this going to happen? What is this going to do to to our, our membership? What is this going to do for our folks that are starting to read through God's Word? But, but what I learned uh, through those months is that, individuals who were committed to Bible literacy, who were reading through God's Word, uh, who were committed to learning the story. The truth is COVID did not slow them down one bit because they were not dependent on coming to a Wednesday night Bible study or listening to a Sunday morning sermon to get fed in the Word. Their primary meal, the primary way that God has worked in their lives was them reading the story for themselves. And as far as conversations about where you're reading, asking questions, you know, we as ministers were still readily available uh, for those things. And so we had a, a whole section of people that still grew tremendously during that time. We had people get saved Amen. during those COVID times. Uh, and, and I know that uh, for a lot of churches, uh, it was a very difficult time of struggle. But but all I can tell you is that every church I know that had people that were really plugged into that CBT framework, I mean, the truth is COVID didn't slow down uh, God's movement in our church and community. Uh, it, it just didn't because, man, people were not dependent on other people to tell them what God's Word says because they were reading it for themselves. And, you know, Amen. I, the you story know. of the Bible works. And, uh, you know, it, 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 when you go through something like that, like COVID, uh, it, it, it really brings that out because the God of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob is our God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you face a crisis, uh, and, and during COVID, when our campuses were stripped away and our ministries and programs were shut down, mm -hmm. the only thing we had left was our understanding of God's word and our ability to pass it on. Mm -hmm. That was all we had. And so uh, I think we, we received the harvest that we sowed. Um, yeah. And I, I think those who sowed to Bible literacy flourished during that time. And there were many churches that did. Uh, but, I, I, you know, talking about exciting stories mm -hmm. uh, as a result of CBT's work and, and people who are, are, are giving themselves to learning the 14-era framework, I, I know for a fact that you have a very exciting story. And I'm very proud of this story. I tell this story over and over, mm -hmm. and I really could tell it, but I, but something, something in me is giving me the sense that you would tell the story better. So, man, what is the most exciting thing? And uh, I bet you he gets more fired up right now than he did the, the previous. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what the most exciting thing uh, about, about CBT, about Bible literacy is. Um, the most exciting thing is that it really, truly, actually works. I've been in student ministry for, for nearly a decade now, and I have tried every strategy, every technique, every study series. Like I've tried them all, done them all, trying to figure out what works the best in what context. But, but I want you to know, the second we change the way we approach teaching our students and our youth, to saying, you know what, we are going to teach that four-tier framework. And not only are we going to do that, but we are going to tell every single student that before you graduate, before you graduate high school, you better be able to, to not only not only have you read through the entire Bible uh, multiple times. Wait, but wait, you wait, can, wait, 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 wait. You're, you're telling me that you tell high school students that they need to have read through the entire Bible before they graduate? I, I'm telling you that the second they enter youth group and before it, if, if I know a family, I look them right in the eye and say, are you, are, are you able to read? And they say, well, yeah, I can read. Well, then you need to be reading God's Word. And it's, it's, it's that simple. Okay, and, and I, just, I just wanted I, to make sure. I'm that, just saying, yeah. yeah. But, okay. But it, not only, though, do they need to have read through God's Word multiple times, but also look at them and say, you know, you need to be able to explain the story. You need to be able to tell someone the story of the Bible before you graduate high school. And, you know, it, it's the funniest thing because I get a little pushback on that sometimes. And my response and the explanation was, well, let me ask them, what, what's your favorite movie? And they'll say, oh, it was, I don't know, it was, it was Avengers or whatever. That's, that's what it seems all their answers are it's now. It's my favorite movie. Some Marvel movie. They say, they, they say that Marvel movie, and I say, okay, well, what's the story of that movie? And they can explain the plot and the characters and some certain dialogue and do the whole scene. And I'm like, well, what's, is the Bible your favorite book? And, of course, if you're in a church setting, they can't say no. So they're like, yeah, sure, the Bible is my favorite book. That is book. such an and, unfair. And so, that is setting them up, man. It that, is. I, I, am, I am. I'm disappointed I in am, you. I am I, setting them up to hold them accountable. You know what? We're going to do another episode on integrity <laughs> and ministry. Hey, integrity is looking someone in the eye and saying, if, if you really believe the Bible is God's word, can you tell me the story? Because here's what I say. I say, one day, one day, you're not going to be in this church, and you're going to be talking to someone. And you're going to, hopefully, attempt to share the gospel with them. And they're going to have a question. And usually that question is something really simple like this. What does the Bible say? And at that point, you're either going to have to find a minister who can explain the story of the Bible to them, or you are going to be able to explain it to them yourself. And there's also going to come a time where someone is going to challenge what you believe about the Bible. And at that point, you're either going to have to find a minister who can answer that question, or you're going to be able to respond with what Amen. the truth of God is. And, and you know, that, that's, that's the truth that we're at. And, and here's the thing. The most All right, wait, wait. So that's the introduction to this story. So, to this story. so I told you he'd get fired up. So the, the, the introduction is you decided as a youth pastor that every graduating high school student was going to read through God's Word before they graduated mm -hmm. and be able to explain the big story of the Bible using the 14-era framework, right? Right. Okay, tell us what happened. When did you make this decision? Uh, 
the 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 first groundwork for implementing this about a year and a half ago. Okay, so a year and a half ago, a a half what ago. is happening right now? Okay, so we uh, actually this next Sunday, this coming Sunday, will be the ninth student who has stood up in front of the entire church Sunday morning service and brought us from Genesis all the way to Revelation. They start with God created, and they and they end with God creating the new heaven and new earth. It, it is the most amazing thing ever. And, and it's they're not reading from a script. There's no notes. They are just up there. They are closing their eyes if they're nervous, and they are just spilling out biblical truth. But you know what the most exciting thing is? And, and I need to make sure everyone knows, this is not high school seniors who have been practicing doing this for years. We we are we've already had someone who has just graduated seventh grade who's going to the eighth grade. It was their first year in the youth group. But because this person was committed to learning God's word and said, I will know it, I will learn it, they're able to story the Bible. We're gonna get to that point where when it's your first year in youth, your very first year, when you're in seventh grade, you know the story of the Bible. Then we have five years to teach you how to story, to teach you how to evangelize. Every single graduate from our church, let me tell you, we're not sending them out wondering, will their faith be able to stand when they're outside the umbrella of the church? It's going to be, we're sending out, and I don't care where they land, because they are going to be a missionary in that community. I'm not afraid of any questions they might come across in college, because they'll have the answers. And I'm not afraid if they end up moving to a faraway community, because they're either going to find a church that's teaching Bible literacy, or they're going to start a church that's teaching Bible literacy. And the fact that we have uh, ministries in our church, youth and student programs uh, in, in our country, and that's not the heart of it, should mess with our minds. It should break our hearts. Mm. We expect students when they graduate high school to be able to do math mm. and to be able to read and to know history. And we have all these tests and all these programs. We expect high school graduates to have a certain level of knowledge. But somewhere down the line, we have started expecting people uh, to graduate high school and never know the story of the Bible. When did the Bible become the least in part, the least important thing for them to study? When did it become good? Uh, when did it become acceptable in our society? Hey, if you want to play baseball in high school, you got to spend at least two hours every single day during that season learning. But hey, five minutes to read your Bible. Ooh, that's a lot to ask for. I'm just saying, somewhere down the line, the, the priority of the Bible has went down, down, down. And the second we start, not just not just suggesting it, but saying this is what we're about, and that Bible becomes more important in their lives. We are seeing salvations. We are seeing, we are, we are seeing students know more about Scripture than people who have been in the church for decades simply because they've committed themselves to learning the story of the Bible. You're right, I got fired up, and I went, I went on a whole thing. And that man, I... was a rant by Jake, brought to you by the Energizer Bunny, who has paid no money to produce this podcast, but keeps going and going, going and, and going. going. <laughs> well, you know, uh, just even just talking and being able to sit down with Ivan May, uh, honestly, it just it re-energizes me. It, it, it gets me pumped uh, for what God is doing uh, in our churches and our ministries. Look, look, and, and I... I, if you do not know Jake and I, I, I'm the pastor of this church, and I've had a front row seat to all that is going on. So I, I'm just I'm so proud uh, that mm -hmm. that we will get to spend eternity in in a line of churches that made Bible literacy a, a core value, and I I'm very proud of the accomplishment and mm -hmm. the achievement. I, I really want to see the day where all of our churches are sending out missionaries uh, from high school. And uh, sending sending gra high school graduates on to the next chapter, whatever that is, uh, mm -hmm. as bold proclaimers of the gospel and able, equipped disciple makers of their generation and the next. Mm -hmm. So you know, as we close out uh, this this episode, this part two of the interview uh, with Iva, you know, we just want to remind you uh, that the story of the Bible works, and that God has revealed Himself in story, and, and CBT exists not to replace uh, the Bible in any way. CBT exists to simply help us understand that story of the Bible. Uh, there are no 
there are no uh, giant hierarchies. There, there's no secret channels or funnels uh, of money. There's no secret strategy. We're not trying to change anything. Honestly, use the free resources of CBT, but, but from the bottom of our hearts, it is better for you to stop watching this podcast right now and open up your Bible and read it than continue even one second more with any other material. We care about Bible literacy more than anything else. Amen. Well, that's been uh, a great, great day. We'll wrap that up. There is a Bible literacy problem in our generation. Therefore, CBT talks. I'm Joel. I'm Jake. See you next week. Have a great one.